Lutheran teaching a wonderful class on American autobiographics last spring. This was my uh, seminar paper for that. And uh, what is the subgenre? I, I suppose you could call it a biography or autobiography. Uh, in the United States, uh, the Native American captivity narrative. Uh, that's uh, what what drew me in most, and I was especially interested in the Hand of Dustin captivity narrative, which uh, was reappropriated by uh, Cotton Mather first in 1697. He's considered the primary source of the story. Uh, Anna never told it herself, uh, so it started with Cotton Mather's sermon. It uh, was retold by uh, several local historians of New England, uh, end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th. John Greenleaf Whittier, better known for his poetry, uh, wrote the first fictionalization. I'm not dealing with his fictionalization here, because it was uh, sort of less interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, young Nathaniel Hawthorne and actually young Henry David Thoreau uh, also fictionalized the Dustin narrative. So I just want to point out they're all male writers, and uh, <laughs> they all did, and this, uh, you know, they all did twist the story to their own particular, uh, whether political or theological, uh, just outright misogynistic. Uh, um, and oh, it kind of distorted, but uh, it moves from sort of Mather's more fact-based account to uh, Thoreau's more just explicitly mythological uh, sort of account in his uh, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. Um, so my guiding question in this essay was basically who among these writers should have been and can actually speak for Hand of Dustin. Um, and much as I would like to avoid retelling the story myself, <laughs> um, as another male writer, I'm interested uh, in producing an interpretation. Uh, it's for the purposes of making a clear argument, I sort of need to do that. So, uh, Haverhill uh, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, this is a map of present day Massachusetts and mostly New Hampshire. Uh, Haverhill was where Hannah Dustin lived with her husband, Thomas, and their eight children. And Haverhill was raided by members of the American Indian Abenaki tribe. Uh, Thomas Dustin fled the raid with seven of the children, leaving Hannah, who was recovering from childbirth, alone with her newborn and her nurse, Mary Neff. Uh, Dustin, Neff, and the newborn baby were taken captive by the Abenakis, and the newborn was killed shortly afterwards on the journey north to this point. Um, Dustin, Neff, and a young boy who was previously being held captive by the Abenakis um, escaped by killing and scalping, well, after the killing, not by, uh, after <laughs> killing and scalping 10 out of 12 members of an Abenaki family, including two men, two women, and six children. The three former captives escaped by canoe and returned with the scouts to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, so again, Cotton Mather, is, his account, his sermon, is uh, considered the most fact-based, and it's considered the primary text. But uh, he also leaves a, a really dense web of biblical allusions and scaffolds a lot of biblical language, which his Puritan contemporaries would have picked up, but I had a harder time picking up the first time through. Uh, and unpacking all of it would actually probably fill up this entire presentation. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> oh, whoops. Uh, back. Sorry. Uh, but to touch on only one of the most obvious biblical allusions in Mather's text, we might note that Mather likens Hannah Dustin's killing of the sleeping Abenaki family to the Old Testament heroine jail's sly killing of an unsuspecting general from an invading foreign army. I'd also like to briefly note that the Latin in the title of Mather's sermon, Du Femina Facti, translates as the woman leader in the deed. All right, I think that's correct. <laughs> uh, in other words, Mather may have told the truth, but he also framed Hannah's captivity and escape as a biblical trial with Hannah as the heroine of the uh, fledgling Puritan colony. Mather's account may be fact-based, and again, it's considered the primary source, but uh, Mather also spun the story to his own political and theological ends. Uh, 
Uh, turning to Hawthorne's much later retelling, a uh, hundred years later at least, um, I'm just going to read portions of my original paper. Uh, in Hawthorne's story, as Dustin is about to kill the Abenaki children, the narrator interjects, as if to plead with Hannah, quote, but oh, the children, their skins are red, yet spare them, Hannah Dustin, spare those seven little ones for the sake of the seven that have fed at your own breast, end quote. This passage draws an explicit connection between the English and Abenaki infanticides, but criticizes Hannah for a lack of maternal instincts. Rather than move on, Hawthorne continues to dramatize this moment, signaling that it is crucial to the limited third-person narrator's gradual coming to grips with Hawthorne's truth about Dustin, quote, Seven, quoth Mrs. Dustin to herself, eight children have I born, and where are the seven? Where is the eighth? The thought nerved her arm, and the copper-colored babes slept the same deep sleep with their Indian mothers, end quote. Hawthorne's focus on the, quote, copper-colored babes, end quote, and their, quote, Indian mothers, end quote, with no mention of the dead Abenaki men seems to negate the possibility that killing them was also criminal. Um, this leads to a reading of Hawthorne's characterization of these dead as emblematic of a form of white paternalism rooted in racist stereotyping, which doesn't seem particularly surprising for a text from this period, but uh, as, as much as it is genuinely disgusting. Um, <laughs> what is somewhat surprising, but perhaps shouldn't be, are the words that Hawthorne stuffs into Hannah Dustin's mouth that again emphasize her lack of strong maternal qualities. This point is further hammered in with the passage on the same page describing the child that Dustin, quote, it is said, meant to save a lie, end quote, and who, according to Hawthorne's narrator, quote, did well to f flee from the raging tigress, end quote. Here, also, in another explicitly misogynistic passage, quote, there was little safety for Redskin when Hannah Dustin's blood was up, end quote. Whatever Hannah Dustin's actual motivations in killing the children might have been, and more to the point, whatever her feelings were on the subject of grace, if a woman in 17th century Puritan New England was allowed to have any feelings on the subject of race, these were not the same feelings of benevolent white paternalism that Hawthorne's narrator displays here. Uh, so another interesting facet of the Dustin captivity highlighted by Hawthorne is the role of Hannah's husband. As we might remember, Thomas Dustin fled the raid with most of the children leaving his wife and newborn behind. Uh, recent scholarship has also revealed that it was Thomas who petitioned the Massachusetts Bay Colony after Hannah returned to receive a bounty for the Abenaki scouts. So here's Hawthorne again, on, uh, this time on Thomas Dustin. Quote, it appears that the thought of his children's danger rushed so powerfully upon his heart that Thomas Dustin quite forgot the still more perilous situation of his wife. <laughs> or, it, as is not improbable, he had such knowledge of the good lady's character as afforded him a comfortable hope that she would hold her own even in the contest with the whole <laughs> tribe of Indians. <laughs> Hawthorne projects strong maternal characteristics onto Thomas, including a deep emotional connection to the children and concern for their well-being, robbing Hannah Dustin of these same qualities. This showcases Hawthorne's own particularly free male agency and his editorship of the American magazine of useful and entertaining knowledge. He represented Hannah Dustin however he liked, liberated from most of the constraints of being fact-based. Hawthorne's mean-spirited reversal robs even Dustin's image of the maternal characteristics it might have retained in Mather's original distortion of her as a Puritan heroine, quote, the female leader in the team. Uh, so for the last section of my presentation, we're going to turn to Henry David Thoreau's uh, retelling. Now it's interesting to note that, that Thoreau's account focuses less on the killings than does Hawthorne's, describing the actions of Dustin, Neff, and the boy captive Whitley. Uh, here's Thoreau, uh, quote, Taking the Indian's tomahawks, they killed them all in their sleep, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> as a reader who has encountered Hawthorne's retelling of the killings may be that Thoreau does not recreate them in similarly grotesque, racially paternalistic, and misogynistic detail, Thoreau's concision in describing the killings makes the actual fact of them seem unimportant. Thoreau's representation as well of the three captives killing them all in their sleep makes this extremely violent event seem painless and unreal in a fairy tale like. This reading of an odd mythic quality in Thoreau's appropriation is only further supported by Thoreau's ending to the Dustin episode, and I quote, uh, This seems a long while ago, and yet it happened since Milton wrote his Paradise Lost. 
But its antiquity is not the less great, for we do not regulate our historical time by the English standard, nor did the English by the Roman, nor the Roman by the Greek. End quote. This passage codifies Thoreau's own retelling of the Dustin story as a foundational myth, um, akin to Milton's retelling of the biblical myth of Satan's fall and role, and his role in the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, Thoreau's representation of Hannah, it seems, does not require any factual source anymore. It's just out there to be discovered at the mouth of the Concord River. Uh, so Thoreau represents uh, Dustin's lack of maternal qualities differently than Hawthorne. Uh, it's Thoreau's fictionalization of Dustin's relationship with the boy captive, actually, that determines uh, Thoreau's representation of Dustin's lack of maternal qualities. And here's another quote. Uh, Having determined to make her escape, Dustin instructed the boy to inquire of one of the men how he should dispatch an enemy in the quickest manner and take a scalp. Strike him there, said he, placing his finger on his temple, and he also showed him how to take off the scalp. After the killings, the English boy struck the Indian who had given him this information on the temple as he had been directed. End quote. Thoreau's long first sentence in this passage cuts down on the narrative energy that Hawthorne's excitable representation of the killings had, while Thoreau's tone and the anecdote evinced to me a rather droll, ironic humor that seems really unethical, uh, given the actual severity of the event. This appropriation by Thoreau of the Dustin captivity might be read as the worst of the lot in, in, in one way. My reason for suggesting this is that Thoreau's appropriation of the Dustin narrative uh, should be held responsible uh, because of its distant mythological connotations and it's said as just another set piece in his week on the Concord and Merrimack rivers. This completes the process of a complete unmooring of the Dustin story from any necessity to acknowledge proven historical facts. So, uh, last, last paragraph here. Um, in other words, Thoreau's retelling of the narrative is what opens the gates to the horrifyingly banal iterations of a further revised image of Dustin, axe and possibly scouts in hand, dressed in a period-inappropriate white dress, in statuary and mass culture. 